Welcome to this video, Storytelling with Data. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about how to go about making your basic visualizations from the data that you put into your data warehouse. As much as I like this book, I don't think it's very good at explaining you how to actually go about designing your basic data visualizations. It doesn't spend much time on it and it definitely does not give you any inputs to the pros and cons of your choices. Therefore, instead of uh, reading that book, I've read a bunch of other books and compiled some of my favorite material into this video to help you get started. The most typical kind of quantitative information that a business will ask for is sums. So these are, for example, totals of quantities or amounts or attendance. Typically, the attendance sums will relate to our factless fact tables. In our data warehouse, the quantitative information is stored in its most granular form. However, in our report or visualizations, these are typically aggregated and then grouped by something else, which is the data that we have in our dimension tables. Often, our quantitative will, information will be compared to some other measure. That could be, for example, a target, a KPI, a trend. It could com be compared to other inf quantitative information such as year over year or same period last year. We can also have quantitative information telling us about the central tendencies of data. One of those, uh, and a very well-known central tendency, is the average, or also in more statistical terms, the means, which is calculated as the sum of all values divided by the number of all values. This will tell you the exact midpoint in your data, uh, minimizing the distance to all the other points in your data. Unless your data is highly skewed, the median may be a preferable measure for the central tendency in your data. We also have other uh, measures such as the mode or mid-range or we can have other functional forms such as min and max that was discussed in the Pipino article on data quality. Okay, just to have a silly example, let's assume that some business asked me to figure out what the ideal uh, dress size for new dresses that they were going to be designing were. I would like to know what is the te central tendencies of heights in women shopping for clothes in my store, and I have data on that. So uh, for the sake of this, let's assume this is a non-gendered person, and here's another non-gendered person, and one more, and one more. If I decide for this purpose to actually compute the average by computing the mean, I'm going to get the height of this person because they're at the same height. So without putting a rule out, you can clearly see that they're the same. So the, the mean is the height of any one of these because they're the same. If I compute the median, then I have to pick the middle one, ordering them by height, they're in the same order. I pick this one, it's still the same. So mean and median become the same. However, if I decide to add a new data point, let's add this lady, and I do the same exercise again, then the mean is going to be this tall because it's going to be the average height of these, so and plus her height, and then that's gonna be this height, right? If I compute the median, however, and I'm ordering them by size now, the median is this. So in this case, if these are my data points, then the median is a better representation, representation of the central tendency of my data because I will be making clothes that actually fit four and not just one or none actually because if I made clothes for this person, nobody would buy it, right? So uh, you can do the same if you're computing, for example, salaries of average Americans. So she is representing now the top 1% or even just Jeff Bezos, then the mean is going to be a poor representation of the average salary of an American. So either I have to remove my outliers and then compute the mean, or I can keep her in and then go with the median as a better representation of my central tendency. 
When we want to describe data sets, we will often rely on statistical properties. And one of the most typical ones is uh, calculating the standard deviation. And by calculating the standard deviation, we get additional information about how our data behaves. Imagine that you have a super, you have two supermarkets. In one super, in both supermarkets, the average wait time in order to get through the line and pay for your groceries is 10 minutes. But in one supermarket, I tell you that the standard deviation is two minutes, and in the other one, the standard deviation is five minutes. You now know that going into the first supermarket, you're more or less guaranteed to be very close to 10 minutes in wait time, whereas in the other one, there's a bigger variation and you might actually end up spending a longer time in there. Now that we know a little bit about the types of quantitative information that we can show to our business people, we need to move on to the next part in which we learn how to present this data to the business people. But, be but before we move into that, I would like to give you some theory in order to understand how humans can perceive input presented to them. That's what this next part of the video is about. This model is borrowed straight out of the marketing literature. Marketing is all about convincing you to buy products, so, so somehow affecting your behavior. And that's also what we want to do when we design either dashboards or reports for business professionals. Professionals, We want them to, to convince them to change their behavior. And this model has three steps. The first step is the stimulus. So that is doing something different. In marketing, it's a product, price, promotion, and place. But here, our stimulus is quite different, and we will get back to that in a minute. Then it, there's the organism. So once you uh, stimulize an organism, and the organism is a human, then that human somehow processes the information that you presented to them, and based on that, uh, choose whether or not to elicit a response. And we will get, go through each step in this uh, model in the, in the coming few minutes. Most of you probably know this, it's called the Miller Liar Illusion. If I present this uh, photo to you and ask you to look at the horizontal lines and tell me which one is longest, your mind is going to be working hard, at least if you haven't seen it before, it's going to be working really hard to figure out which one is the longest. So the way I'm stimulating you with this actually affects how much time your brain needs to process it, this information. And as you will see in just a minute, it doesn't have to be that bad a stimulus. I can present the same a visual cue to you in a different way, where the way that I'm designing the stimulus, which is uh, this graph, actually affects how much time you need to process it. Now you see it became much easier. So the first thing that we need to know something about is, of course, how can we use our, how can we use knowledge about how to design stimulus to actually affect our organism. When designing dashboard, that begins with choosing the right scale. As you see from this image, you can actually lie with the scaling. So on the left hand side, you have this huge increase. But if you actually scale it properly, it's not a huge increase at all. It looks as what it is on the right hand side. So make sure to choose the right scaling for your design. your dashboard or your report then becomes the stimulus for an organism and that organism is a human. The problem with humans is, is that they're not computers. They have faulty memory and they have inadequate memory. If you divide the human memory into three different types of memories, then you have the sensory memory, the short-term memory, and the long-term memory. Once you have a sensory input, it first arrives in the sensory memory. This stays here for only a, a very, very short time, a few seconds tops. And this is where you elicit the most gut reaction instincts. So if, for example, in the Miller liar illusion we saw earlier, in the first photo, your gut instinct may be, oh, I don't know, and then you just skip the, the uh, 
actually understanding the data but for the second one where you had the red lines then you will be more receptive and go oh okay it's fine i, I can do this then you will commit the the illustration or the dashboard of the report to your short-term memory and this stays for an average of seven seconds no more than maximum 15 seconds and you can only have a few chunks of information in your short short-term memory at a time so not too much if you don't rehearse it it will never commit to your long-term memory and it's just going to be lost. But if you do decide to commit it to your long-term memory, then actually it could be there indefinitely if you don't get sick. You have about seven seconds to convince someone that the dashboard of the report you're designing is important to them because that's how long short-term memory lasts on average. Another problem with humans are that they are faulty. So if you have consistent systematic error in your thinking, that can be called a cognitive bias, and you have different examples of cognitive bias. That could be priming bias, confirmation bias, self-serving bias, belief bias, framing, hindsight bias. There are lots of different types of bias. I will show you an example right now. Here's a fun fact. During the COVID pandemic lockdown in the spring of 2020, female employee at Copenhagen Business School reported that they were responsible for 60% of the childcare at home. Now, quickly, how much of the childcare were male faculty responsible for? If you said 40%, or if you thought 40% in your head, then you have just suffered framing bias because the fact that I posed you a question after giving you some facts and with the knowledge that percentages ought to add up to 100, you might think, oh, 40. But uh, actually, that was not the case. It was much less. The percentage of childcare taken care of by male faculty at CBS was 20%. If you manage to make your design in such a way that you understand that you only have a very short time to actually make sure that the person you're designing for will find your visualization interesting. And if you also understand to design in such a way that you can use your knowledge about human memory and their cognitive flaws, then the result is going to be that you are able to convince them about what you want. And how are you going to do this? Well, I'm going to post the full slide section after this video, and I'm also going to uh, post resources to things you can read. I'm going to post some exercises for you to try and explore this, and we will have a discussion in class about what is good design.